Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier. Dramatized for radio by Brian Miller. With Christopher Casanova, Janet Moore, Rosalie Crutchley, Nicholas Grace, and Frederick Treves. Rebecca. Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. I was aware of a change from before. The woods crowded dark and uncontrolled to the drive. When I saw the grey stones of Manderley shining in the moonlight of my dream, I could swear the house lived and breathed as it had done in the old days. But a cloud came over the moon, and the house reverted to what I knew it really was, a soulless, desolate sepulchre. Our fear and suffering lay in its ruins. There would be no resurrection. I wake up from my dream and lie here many hundreds of miles from England in a bare little hotel bedroom, comforting for its lack of atmosphere. He and I travel constantly now from one small hotel to another. And if we are sometimes bored, well, boredom can be a relief from fear. I won't tell him my dream, for Manderley is ours no longer. Manderley is no more. I remember how very different I was from the woman he depends on now. I was awkward and gauche, a silly little companion to Mrs. Van Hopper at Monte Carlo all those years ago when I met him for the first time. Maxim de Winter was staying at the same hotel. You know, I recognize you as soon as you walked into the restaurant this morning, Mr. De Winter. I thought, why, there's Billy's friend, Mr. De Winter. I simply must join those snaps of Billy and Dora taken on their honeymoon. I sent her up to get them at once. Here they are. Oh. There's Dora. Isn't she simply adorable? Billy's crazy about her. He hadn't met her when he gave that party at Claridge's where I saw you first. But I dare say you don't remember an old woman like me. On the contrary, I remember you very well. Hmm. I have to say, I don't think I'd like Palm Beach all that much. If Billy had a home like your Mandalay, I don't suppose he'd play around in Palm Beach. I'm told it's like fairyland. I haven't been there, of course, but I've seen pictures of it. I wonder you can ever bear to leave it. <coughs> of course, you Englishmen are always so modest about your home, so deprecating. He won't admit it, my dear, but I believe Mandel has been in his family's possession since the conquest. I suppose your family often entertained royally there, Mr. De Winter. Not since Ethelred. Ethelred? The one who was called the Unready. In fact, it was while staying with my family that the name was given him. He was invariably late for dinner. Oh, really? I'd no idea how interesting. And uh, what do you think of Monte Carlo? Or don't you think of it at all? I think it's all a bit artificial. She's spoiled, Mr. De Winter. That's her trouble. Most girls would give their eyes for the chance of seeing Monte. Uh, wouldn't that rather defeat the purpose? I'm faithful to Monty. My constitution won't take the English winner. What brings you here? Did you bring your golf clubs? I came away in rather a hurry. The West Country must be delightful in the spring. Yes, Mandalay was looking its best. I was too young. That was the trouble. Had I been older, I would have realized that he was making some kind of bond with me through his remarks to Mrs. Van Hopper. As it was, I blushed with shame and embarrassment. Even Mrs. Van Hopper noticed and commented upon what seemed his almost rudely abrupt departure. But later, I received a note delivered by the lift boy. Forgive me. I was very rude this afternoon. No signature. No beginning. The boy asked if there was any answer, and I said no. 
As fate would have it, Mrs. Van Hopper fell ill with flu and took to her bed, pampering herself by hiring a full-time nurse who largely relieved me of my responsibilities. I found myself alone at lunch. Stupidly, I knocked over the vase of flowers on the table. In a second, someone was by my side. Oh! <laughs> You can't sit at a wet tablecloth. It'll put you off your feet. No, I don't mind. It doesn't matter a bit. I'm all alone. Come and have luncheon with me. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly. Why not? Please, don't be polite. It'll be perfectly all right if the waiter just wipes the cloth. But I'm not being polite. I want you to have lunch with me. Even if you hadn't knocked over that vase so clumsily, I should have asked you. You don't believe me. Never mind. Come and sit down. We needn't talk to each other unless we feel things. You uh, got my note, I suppose. Mm. I felt very much ashamed of myself. My manners were atrocious. The only excuse I have is that I've become boorish through living alone. That's why it's so kind of you to have lunch with me today. You weren't rude. At least not the sort of rudeness she would understand. <laughs> that curiosity of hers, she doesn't mean to be offensive. She does it to everyone. That is everyone of importance. I ought to be flattered, then. And why should she consider me of importance? I think because of Manderley. They say he can get over his wife's death, Rebecca. An appalling tragedy. He never talks about it, never mentions her name. She was drowned, you know, in the bay near the house. My mornings were now largely free. Maxim de Winter took to driving me round on little excursions. If he had driven me round in circles, it wouldn't have mattered to me. In his very nearness, I was beginning to liberate myself from the dreary life of a lady's companion. You'll think me impertinent and rude, I dare say. But I would like to know why you asked me to come out in the car day after day. You're being kind, that's obvious. But why do you choose me for your charity? You know everything there is to know about me, but I know nothing more about you than I did the first day we met. And what did you know then? Why, that you lived at Manderley. And that you had lost your wife. You would like, you once told me at a chosen moment, to live the past again. I'm afraid I think rather differently from you. Something happened a year ago that altered my whole life, and I want to forget every phase in my existence up to that time. Those days are finished. You have blotted out the past for me, you know, far more effectively than all the bright lights of Monte Carlo. Damn your idea of my kindness and my charity. I ask you to come with me because I want you and your company. And if you don't believe me, you can leave the car now and find your own way home. Go on, open the door and get out. I want to go home. Oh, to hell with all this. I suppose you are young enough to be my daughter, and I don't know how to deal with you. You can forget all I've said. That's all finished and done with. Don't let's ever think of it again. My family always called me Maxim. I'd like you to do the same. You've been formal with me long enough. I never saw Rebecca, but I believe she was very lovely. They used to give tremendous parties at Mandalay. It was all very sudden and tragic. His wife, Rebecca. I had a book in my hands, a book of poems he had given me to read, and on the first white page was written, Max from Rebecca. A careless, easy hand in long, slanting strokes. She called him Max, familiar, easy on the tongue. And just now he had told me I could call him Maxim. My daughter Helen is sailing for New York on Saturday. They've cabled her to return home. Little Nancy has a threatened appendix. That's decided me. We're going too. I'm tired to death of Europe. How do you like the idea of seeing New York?
I should say goodbye to him in the lounge, perhaps. A furtive, scrambled farewell while Mrs. Van Hopper monopolised the leave-taking. And as she went on and on about writing and so forth, he would light a cigarette, and I would think, four and a half minutes to go, and I shall never see him again. I know I cried all that night, bitter, youthful tears that couldn't come from me today. You don't sob deeply into a pillow after the age of 21. The next morning I ran to his room. So, Mrs. Van Hopper has had enough of Monte Carlo and now she wants to go home. So do I. She to New York and I to Mandalay. Which would you prefer? You can take your choice. What? Take your choice. Don't make a joke about it. It's unfair. And I think I'd better see about those tickets and say goodbye now. If you think I'm one of those people who try to be funny at breakfast, you're wrong. I'm invariably ill-tempered in the early morning. I repeat to you once more, the choice is open to you. Either you go to America with Mrs Van Hopper or you come to Mandalay with me. You mean you want a secretary or something? No. I'm asking you to marry me, you little fool. I'm... I'm not the sort of person men marry. What the devil do you mean by that? <laughs> I don't think I know how to explain. I don't belong to your sort of world, for one thing. Well, what is my world? Well, Mandalay. You think I asked you this on the spur of the moment, don't you? You think I asked you to marry me for the same reason you believed I drove you about and took you to dinner to be kind, don't you? Yes. One day you'll realise that philanthropy is not my strongest quality. At the moment, I don't think you realise anything at all. You haven't answered my question. Are you going to marry me? My suggestion doesn't seem to have gone too well. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I rather thought you loved me. A fine blow to my conceit. I do love you. I've been crying all night because I thought I should never see you again. Oh, oh. oh bless you for that. <laughs> it's a pity you have to grow up. He hadn't asked Rebecca to marry him in this way. Max, from Rebecca. Later, I opened the book of poems to that white page. She was dead. One must not have thoughts about the dead. They slept in peace. The grass blew over their graves. I cut the page right out of the book. The book looked white and clean when the page was gone. But I had to get up and look at the torn fragments of the cut-out page in the waste basket. Even now, the ink was thick and black. The writing was not destroyed. I took a match and set light to the fragments. The fire burned them to feathery dust. I suppose I've got to hand it to you. You're a fast worker. Still waters can certainly run deep in your case. You realize he's years older than you. He's only 42. Of course, you know why he's marrying you, don't you? Ha! Huh, you haven't flattered yourself he's in love with you. The fact is, that empty house got on his nerves to such an extent he nearly went off his head. He just can't go on living there alone. Maxim, just look at those rhododendrons. Like them? It's all so beautiful. <laughs> Here, straighten your fur. Oh. I should have given you time to buy a few decent clothes when we stopped over in oh, London. It doesn't matter as long as you don't mind. Who are all those people? Oh, damn that woman. She knows perfectly well I didn't want this sort of thing. I'm afraid you'll have to face it. Mrs. Danvers has collected the whole staff from the house and estate to welcome us. Oh. Oh, it's all right. You won't have to say anything. I'll do it all. Here's Frith. You'd call him the faithful old retainer. Hello, Frith. 
Everything well? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. A welcome home. And hope you've been keeping well, sir, and madam. Oh, we're all right, but we're tired and we want our tea. I didn't expect this business. Mrs. Danvers' orders, sir. Ranged one behind the other in the hall, overflowing to the stone passages beyond, a sea of faces, open-mouthed and curious, gazing at me as though it were my execution. Someone tall and gaunt advanced, dressed in deep black, whose prominent cheekbones and hollow eyes gave her a skull's face, parchment white, set on a skeleton's frame. This is Mrs. Danvers. Welcome to Mandalay, madam. I speak for myself and on behalf of the staff. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad to be here. I will introduce you to each member of the household. Uh, your gloves. What? You dropped your gloves. Oh. Allow me, madam. There. Thank you, Mrs. Danvers. Uh, Mrs. Danvers wondered, madam, whether you'd like to see your room when you've finished your tea. Oh. What sort of job are they made at the East Wing, Prith? Oh, very nice indeed, sir. <laughs> Mrs. Danvers was afraid the workman wouldn't be finished before you arrived, sir. Oh. Have you been making alterations? Oh, a bit of redecorating. I thought we'd use the suite in the East Wing. Much more cheerful on that side of the house. A good view of the Rose Garden. It was the visitor's wing when my mother was alive. Look, run along and make friends with Mrs. Danvers. It's a good opportunity. What was this room like before? Oh, it had a mauve paper and different hangings. Mr. De Winter did not think it very cheerful. It was never much used, but he gave special orders in his letters that you would have this room. Then it wasn't his bedroom originally? Oh, no, madam. I suppose you've been at Mandalay longer than anyone else. Oh, not as long as Frith. He was here when Mr. De Winter was a boy. You didn't come till after that? No, not till after that. I came here when the first Mrs. De Winter was a bride. Mrs. Danvers, I hope we shall become friends, and I, I want us to understand one another. This kind of life is new to me, and all I want to do is make Mr. De Winter happy. I know I can leave all the household arrangements to you... And you must run things as you always have. Whatever you say. <laughs> of course, it was different when Mrs. De Winter was alive. There was a lot of entertaining then, and she liked to supervise things herself. I would rather leave it all to you, much rather. Can I do anything more for you now? No, I think I have everything. You've made the room so charming. I only followed Mr. De Winter's instructions. He said you would prefer to be on this side... The rooms in the West Wing are very old. The bedroom there is twice as big as this one. It's the most beautiful room in the house. And the windows look down across the lawns to the sea. I suppose Mr De Winter keeps the most beautiful rooms to show to the public. Well, the bedrooms are never shown to the public. They used to live in the West Wing and use those rooms when Mrs De Winter was alive. The big bedroom I was telling you about was Mrs De Winter's bedroom. I see. You could never tell you were within five minutes of the sea from this wing, could you? The next day, I made my way down to the morning room. It was a woman's room, graceful, fragile. The room of someone who had chosen each article of furniture with great care so that everything was in perfect harmony with her own personality. This I will have, and this, and this, I could hear her saying, taking piece by piece from Mandalay's treasures, each object that pleased her best, with a sure instinct for only the most exquisite. And everywhere, fresh rhododendrons, flowing into the room from their natural home in the gardens outside, on the mantelpiece, on the table by the sofa, and on the writing desk beside the golden candlesticks. Oh. Who is it? Mrs. De Winter. Who do you want? 
Mrs. De Winter? I'm afraid you've made a mistake. Mrs. De Winter has been dead for over a year. It's Mrs. Danvers, madam. I'm speaking to you on the house telephone. Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Danvers. I, I didn't even know we had one. I was wondering if you approved of the menus for today. Oh, I'm sure I do. It would be better, I think, if you read the list. You will find the menu of the day on the blotter beside you. What? This? Oh, yes, yes. Very suitable indeed. You'll notice I left a blank space beside the sauce. I'm not sure which sauce you're used to with the roast veal. Oh, well, let me see. I hardly know. I think we'd better have what you usually have, whatever you think Mrs. De Winter would have ordered. I rather think Mrs. De Winter would have ordered a wine sauce, madam. We'll have the same, then. I'm very sorry I disturbed you while you were writing, madam. I heard the sound of a car in the drive at twelve. I knew it would be Maxim's sister, Beatrice, and her husband, Giles, coming to inspect me. My courage caved in, and I thought I would head for my bedroom where I would wait for a suitable moment before going down. But I must have lost my bearings, for passing through a door at the head of the stairs, I came to a long corridor I hadn't seen before, and to another staircase. I opened a door and found a room in total darkness. Dimly, I could see the outline of furniture swathed in dust sheets. I shut the door softly, and walking in the corridor again, I realised I was in the west wing. I came to a little alcove, where a broad window looked out directly onto the lawns and the sea. Oh! oh. Madam! Ah, Mrs Danvers, I was looking for my bedroom... You've come into the opposite side of the house. Did you go into any of the rooms? I just opened the door of one of them. If you wish to open up the rooms, I'll have it done. Any time when you've nothing to do, you have only to ask me and I'll show you the rooms in the West Wing. I'll have the dust sheets removed and you can see the rooms as they looked when they were used. It would take only a short while to have the rooms in readiness. It's very kind of you. Now I think I must greet the Laceys. I heard their car just now. You know your way, don't you? Maxim always dumped the bachelors into this room. <laughs> well, it's charming, I must say. Looks out over the rose garden, which was always an advantage. <laughs> now we've got the men out of the way. May I powder my nose? Of course, Beatrice. <laughs> Oh, Danvers, do this up for you. Yes, I think she's done it very well. <laughs> These are nice brushes. Wedding present. Oh, Maxim gave them to me. My brother has some taste. <laughs> but then he was educated into it, wasn't he? Do you suppose you'll be having lots of people down? I don't know. Maxim hasn't said. Funny old boy. I never knows with him. <laughs> One time the place was always chock-a-block. Some I... Can't see you. Oh, well, never mind. <laughs> Pity you don't ride or shoot. You miss such a lot. You don't sail by any chance, do you? No. Thank God for that. Come and see us if you like. I always expect people to ask themselves. Life's too short to send out invitations. Thank you very much. <laughs> Forgive me if I've said a lot of rude things. Tact was never my strong point, as Maxim will tell you. I have to say, you're not a bit what I expected. You see, you're so very different from Rebecca. Your hair? <laughs> of course I like it. It's a bit wet, of course. Sorry about that. But I had to take a walk after seeing Beatrice, rain or no rain. Oh. I find a little of my family goes a long way. She was nice. 
She said I was quite different from what she expected. So what the devil did she expect? Someone much smarter, more sophisticated, I guess. Beatrice can sometimes be infernally unintelligent. I loved walking through Happy Valley just now. It's exactly how you described it to me in Monte Carlo. It's a bit of a contrast to this cove. Comes on you as a shock, doesn't it? Jasper? Jasper, where are you? Perhaps he's gone back to the Happy Valley. Well, he was by that rock a minute ago, sniffing a dead seagull. Come back! We don't want to go that way. Oh, the dog can look after himself. Perhaps he's fallen, poor little chap. No, he's all right. He knows his own way back. Yeah. Hello. Uh, I know that dog. He comes from the house. Yes. He's not yourn. He's Mr. De Winter's dog. I want to take him back to the house. Then the man looked at me and smiled, toothlessly and none too intelligently. He had been digging for shells. I wondered if there were any string to use as a lead for Jasper in the nearby boathouse, and I walked towards it. I expected to find the usual dirty boat store, and it was dirty all right. But it was done up like a cottage, with furniture, cups, plates, and bookshelves. There was a queer, musty smell about the place. The rain pattered on the roof with a hollow sound and tapped on the boarded up windows. I looked about for some string, but there was none anywhere. I saw a door at one end of this room and I went to it and opened it, a little fearful now, a little afraid, for I had the odd, uneasy feeling that I might come upon something unawares, something I had no wish to see, something that might harm me. But it was nonsense. I knew it was. I opened the door, and there was the boat store after all. Before long, I had cut off a piece of string from a ball of twine and returned to the beach. There. That's got you now, Jasper. I saw he go in there now. Yes, it's all right. Mr. De Winter won't mind. She don't go in there now. No, not now. She's gone in the sea, ain't she? She won't come back no more. No, she'll not come back. I never said nothing, did I? No, of course not. Don't worry. Come on, Jasper. <coughs> oh, sorry I was such a time, Maxim. It was Jasper's fault. He kept barking at that man. Who was he? Oh, only Ben. He's quite harmless, poor devil. His family lived near the home farm. Where did you get that string? In the boathouse on the beach. Was the door open? Yes. I found the string in the back room. Oh. Now, the boathouse is meant to be locked. Did Ben tell you it was open? No, he didn't seem to understand anything I said. No, he makes out he's worse than he is. He's probably in and out of it all the time. I don't think so. It looked completely deserted. The damps got into everything. The books are spoiled, the chairs and that sofa. Come on, Jasper, for God's sake. Pull him along a bit. Make him keep up with us. It's your fault. You walk so fast. We can't keep up. If you'd listened to me instead of rushing off over the rocks, we'd be home by now. I thought Jasper might have fallen. I was afraid of the tide. Do you think I'd have left the dog there if it had been any question of the tide? I told you not to go, and now you're grumbling because you're tired. I'm not grumbling, but anyone would have trouble keeping up with this pace. I thought you were going to come with me to find Jasper anyhow. Why should I exhaust myself careering about after the damned dog? You're exhausting yourself plenty right now. You're just saying that about Jasper as an excuse. Excuse? Why should I want an excuse for not coming with you to the beach? Oh, Maxim, how should I know? You just didn't want to, that's all. I could see it in your face. See what in my face? I I've already told you. Oh, 
Let's drop the subject, please. All right, I didn't want to go to the beach. Will that please you? I never go near the bloody place and that damned boathouse. And if you had my memories, you wouldn't want to go there either. Or talk about it, or even think about Maxie, it. Maxie, please. I don't want you to look like that. Let's forget what we said. Please let everything be all right. We ought to have stayed abroad. We ought never to have come back to Mandalay. Oh, God, what a fool I was to come back! The rain and the gloom settled on us for some days. A misery broken for me only by the arrival of my wedding present from Beatrice. A history of painting in four big volumes, dear Beatrice. She knew my one claim to a hobby was sketching, and she herself probably never opened a book from one year to the next. I arranged them in a row on the writing desk, but one of them fell, and in doing so knocked a little china cupid onto the floor, smashing it to pieces. I felt like a guilty child, swept up the fragments and hid them in an envelope at the back of one of the drawers of the writing desk. That Cupid was worth a hell of a lot. Mrs. Danvers has accused Robert the Footman of purloining it. Doesn't seem to be any other reason for it to be missing. God, I hate these servants' complications. Darling, I meant to tell you before. I broke the Cupid yesterday. Well, why didn't you say so? Now you'll have to explain the whole business to her. Oh, please, Maxim, you tell her. I'm so afraid of what you... Oh, it was all a mistake, Mrs. Danvers. My wife broke the cupid and forgot to say anything. I'm very sorry if Robert's got into trouble. Is it possible to repair it? I'm afraid not. It's smashed into little pieces. What did you do with the pieces? I I put them in an envelope. Well, what did you do with the envelope? I, I put it at the back of one of the drawers in the writing desk. And it looks as though Mrs. De Winter thought you would put her in prison, doesn't it, Mrs. Tanvers? Perhaps you'd find the envelope and send the pieces up to London. If it's too far gone, there's nothing for it. And tell Robert to dry his tears. I'll apologise to Robert, of course. Perhaps if such a thing should happen again, Mrs. De Winter would tell me herself. It will save everybody a lot of unpleasantness. Quite. Thank you, Mrs. Danvers. I'm sorry, darling. Oh, my dear child, what does it matter? I wonder if I did a very selfish thing in marrying you. What do you mean? Well, are you happy here? I'm not much of a companion to you at my age. Oh, that's ridiculous. Of course we're companions, and I am happy. I love Mandalay and everything about it. You were right to come back. You don't really think we made a mistake, do you, Maxim? You know our marriage is a wonderful success. How can I answer you? If you say we're happy, then we must be. Agreed? Agreed. The smashed Cupid had been a wedding present for Rebecca. Oh, look, Max, look what we've been sent, she would have said as she plunged her hands into the box of shavings. We'll have it in the morning room. And he must have knelt down beside her, and they must have looked at the little Cupid together. I felt oddly free when Maxim went overnight to London on business, curiously happy. I took Jasper for walks on our own. I swam in the sea. I was drawn to the boathouse again and went inside, only to surprise Ben stealing a fishing line from the boat store. He was terrified, like a child. And I tried to calm him by saying we would keep it a secret. He gave me a shell he'd collected as a present. That's yourn. Thank you. It's very pretty. <laughs> You've got angel's eyes. Not like the other one. Tall and dark she was. She gave you the feeling of a snake. I seen her here with my own eyes. Be night she'd come. I looked in once. She turned on me. She said, you don't know me, do you? You never see me here and you won't anymore. If I catch you looking in the windows again, I'll have you put in this asylum. She's gone now, isn't she? No one's going to put you in the asylum, Ben.
the feeling of a snake. As I was walking back to the house, I saw a stranger's car in the drive, a long, low sports car. I glanced up at the west wing and saw to my surprise that the shutters of one of the windows were open. A man was standing there. He must have seen me, for he drew back suddenly, and an arm in a black sleeve reached up to close the shutters. That arm surely belonged to Mrs Danvers. I expect she's gone to the library. She's come home early for some reason. If she's there, you'll be able to go through the hall without her seeing you. Oh. <laughs> I beg your pardon. I, I hope I didn't startle you. Of course not. I wasn't expecting callers, that's all. What a shame. Actually, I popped down to look up old Danny. She was most anxious not to disturb you. It doesn't matter in the least. And uh, how's old Max? Maxine? Very well. He's gone up to London. And left the bride all alone, huh? <laughs> ah, hello, Danny. All your precautions were in vain. The mistress of the house was hiding in here. Well, aren't you going to introduce me? This is Mr. Favell, madam. Well, I suppose I'm not going to be invited to tea. I'd better be on my way. Come and have a look at my car. Why don't you? Much faster than anything Max has. What do you say? Where? Where is the car? Just in the drive. You coming too, Danny? No, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Jack. There. What do you think of it? Very nice. Come for a ride to the lodge gates. No, I don't think I will. I'm rather tired. Oh, well. I mustn't lead the bride astray. I wish I'd got a bride waiting for me at home. I'm just a poor, lonesome old bachelor. <laughs> By the way, it would be extremely sporting of you if you didn't mention this little visit of mine to Max. He doesn't exactly approve of me, I'm afraid. <laughs> Can't think why not. Anyhow, it might get old Danny into trouble. Comprenez? Yes, all right. Very ah. well. I wondered what Mrs. Danvers and a man like Jack Favell had to do with one another. Or was he something to do with Rebecca? It seemed impossible. So why were he and Mrs. Danvers in the West Wing? Why had they closed the shutters when they saw me approach the house? I had this strange impulse now to creep upstairs to the West Wing and see these rooms for myself. Yes, her room, this room. But where were the dust sheets? They were gone. The room was alive again. The bed made up, fresh flowers. A satin dressing gown lay on a chair and a pair of slippers beneath. In a minute, Rebecca herself would come back into the room, sit down before the looking glass humming a tune, reach for her comb and run it through her hair. It was the most beautiful room in the house. All the things in it I would have loved and almost worshipped if they had been mine. But I knew they were not mine. They belonged to somebody else. Would you like to touch her nightdress again? Feel it. Hold it, how soft and light it is, isn't it? I did everything for her, you know. I won't have anyone but you, Danny, she used to say. Put her dressing gown up against you. Oh, yes, yeah, she was taller than you. Much taller. But you can still smell the scent from the wardrobe, can't you? You, know, you always knew when she'd just been in a room from the whiff of her scent. She was wearing slacks and a shirt when she died. They were torn from her body in the water, though. Her beautiful face was unrecognisable. Mr De Winter identified her. He went to Edgecombe to do it. No one could stop him. I shall always blame myself for the accident. 
I'd gone to Kerry for the afternoon and stayed late as Mrs. de Winter was in London and wasn't expected back until much later. When I returned here at half past nine, I was told she'd been and gone. It was brewing up for a storm. I was so worried I went to Mr. de Winter after his own return from an evening out. He told me she was probably spending the night at the boathouse on the beach. I couldn't sleep. I kept wondering what she was doing. And the next day, one of the life boys was washed up of Kerith. Bits and pieces of rigging came in with the tide. You know now why Mr. De Winter doesn't use these rooms anymore, don't you? Listen to the sea. Sometimes I seem to catch the sound of her dress sweeping the stairs as she comes down to dinner. Do you think she can see us talking now? Do you think the dead come back and watch the living? I don't know, Mrs. Danvers. Sometimes I wonder if she comes back here to Mandalay and watches you and Mr. De Winter together. I asked myself why Mrs. Danvers had become more confidential towards me and whether this had anything to do with the fact that I discovered her with Jack Favell. But now, a new event was about to unfold, initiated, oddly enough, by one of our more tiresome social acquaintances whom we were obliged to entertain from time to time, Lady Crowen. Oh, Mr. de Winter, there's something I've been meaning to ask you for ages. Tell me, is there any chance of you reviving the Manderley fancy dress ball? I could tell Maxim plainly hated the idea, yet I couldn't say no to it. When I said I'd quite like a ball, that decided it as far as he was concerned. It's the first ball since Mrs. De Winter was alive. I wonder Mr. De Winter doesn't make it a period ball. Everyone dressed more or less the same, to be in keeping. I never think it looks right to see a clown in patches dancing with an elegant lady. Have you decided what to wear? No, I haven't. Well, I wonder you don't copy one of the portraits in the gallery. The girl in white, a Rayburn, portrait of Caroline de Winter, a sister of Mr. de Winter's great-great-grandfather, a famous London beauty for many years. The dress would be easy to copy, those puffed sleeves, the flounce, the little bodice. It must be a surprise. I won't give you away. We all have our little secrets from time to time, don't we? <laughs> I'm getting dress fever already. What fun it all is. <laughs> I'm so glad you decided to do this again, Maxim. You've got my wife to thank for it. It wasn't me. Lady Crowen suggested it. The local gentry must have their ball at Mandalay. I'm longing to see your dress. <laughs> oh, it's nothing, really, it isn't. She says none of us will know her. Oh, what's the time? I wonder if we ought to be thinking of getting ready. Fairy lights, a band, catering. Mandalay's come alive again, Maxim. It's a dress fit for the Queen of England. Well, what about under the left shoulder, there? That strap of mine, is it going to show? Uh, no, madam. No, nothing shows. Oh. How is it? How do I look? Oh, give me the wig. Careful, don't crush it. I'll brush your hair first. Oh, Clarice, what will Mr. de Winter say? Uh. Who's there? You can't come in. It's me, Beatrice, oh. my dear. How far have you got? I want to look at No, you can't come in. I'm not ready. I'll be down soon. Don't wait for me, all of you. And tell Maxim he can't come in. Oh, Maxim's down already. He said he hammered on your bathroom door and he never answered. Now, don't be too long, my dear. We're all so intrigued. Well, Clarice, how do I look? Beautiful, madam. Like Cinderella. <laughs> or like... Caroline de Winter. Would you make the drummer announce me, please? And then call out Miss Caroline de Winter. Miss Caroline de Winter. How do you do, Mr. De Winter? What the hell do you think you're doing? 
It's the picture. It's the picture, the one in the gallery. What is it? What have I done? Go and change. It doesn't matter what you put on. Find an ordinary evening frock. Anything will do. Go now, before anyone else comes. Oh, what are you standing there for? Didn't you hear what I said? <laughs> Of course, I knew at once it was a terrible mistake. But then you couldn't possibly have known. Have known what? Why, the dress, you poor dear. It was what Rebecca did at the last fancy dress ball at Manderley. Identical. No. With the same picture, the same dress. And when you were announced standing on the stairs for one ghastly moment, I, I thought... I ought to have known. I ought oh. Nonsense, how could you? <laughs> only, only Maxim. What about Maxim? He thinks you did it deliberately. No, no! Oh, you had some bet you could startle him, didn't you? No. Well, only a foolish joke, and of course he doesn't understand. What am I going to do? How am I going to tell him? I'll do that. I'll get him alone for a minute and explain the whole thing. Meanwhile, you must get ready to go down. No, I'm not coming down. But you must, dear, for Maxim's sake as well as your own. What will he do without his hostess? <coughs> Would you like some brandy? I know it's only Dutch courage, but sometimes it helps. No, I don't want anything. I shall have to go down. They're about to have dinner. Don't leave it too late, dear. Everything will come out all right in the end. Are you sure it's safe to leave you? Yes. And thank you, Beatrice. Mrs. Danvers. Yes. What is it? Mrs. Danvers. The day started off well, but now the fog is closing in from the sea. I left the menu on the desk. Do you want something changed? You've done what you wanted, haven't you? Are you pleased now? After what happened last night? Why did you ever come here? Nobody wanted you at Manderley. Why didn't you stay in France? You seem to forget that I love Mr. De Winter. If you loved him, you'd never have married him. What? I thought I hated you. But I don't now. It seems to have spent itself, all the feeling I had. Why should you hate me? you tried to take Mrs. De Winter's place. You set yourself against me from the first. Why? Many people marry twice. Haven't we as much right to be happy as anyone else? Happy? Mr. De Winter isn't happy. Any fool can see that. It's not true. He was happy when we were in France. Well, he's a man, isn't he? No man denies himself on his honeymoon. How dare you speak to me like that? You made me wear that dress because you wanted him to suffer. Why? Hasn't he suffered enough? Do you think all his agony and pain will bring Mrs. De Winter back again? Well, what do I care for his suffering? He never cared about mine. Mrs. Danvers! How do you think I've liked it? Watching you sit in her place, walk in her footsteps, touch the things that were hers. Listen while the servants call you Mrs. De Winter. Mrs. De Winter has gone out for a walk, or Mrs. De Winter won't be into tea until five o'clock. And all the while, my Mrs. De Winter lies cold in her grave. Oh, she didn't care. She wasn't afraid. She had the spirit of a boy. She ought to have been a boy. I had the care of her as a child. You knew that, didn't you? What's the use of all this? I don't want to hear any more. Yes. You couldn't beat her for spirit. She cared for nothing and no one. And then she was beaten in the end. But it wasn't a man. It wasn't a woman. It was the sea that got her. It was the sea was too strong for her. The sea got her in the end. Mrs. Danvers, you're <laughs> ill. Why don't you go to bed and rest? Oh, leave me alone. What's it to you if I show my grief? I'm not ashamed of it. I don't shut myself up in my room to cry, pacing up and down, up and down all night, like Mr. De Winter. He doesn't do that. He did, after she died. Up and down, up and down in the library. I watched him through the keyhole. 
He was like a caged animal. I don't want to hear. And then you say you made him happy on his honeymoon. I wonder what Mr. De Winter thought when his precious honeymoon was over and he had you back here at Mandalay with all the servants laughing at you. You'd better go to your room. Oh, the mistress of the house thinks I'd better go to my room. And after that, what? Will she go running to Mr. De Winter, saying Mrs. Danvers has been unkind to her, like she ran to him and told him about Mr. Jack's visit? I never told him Mr. Favell had been here. That's a lie. Who else told him? Oh, well, what do I care? Mr. Jack is her cousin. It's my last link with my lady. I'll see him if I please. But your Mr. De Winter has forbidden him the house. He hasn't forgotten to be jealous, has he? What do you mean? He was jealous while she lived, and now he's jealous when she's dead. He still forbids Mr. Jack the house. That shows you he hasn't forgotten her, doesn't it? Of course he was jealous, and so was I. And so was everyone that knew her. Men were mad for her, all of them. If she didn't care, she only laughed. She'd have them down for the weekends to stay, men she'd met in London. Picnic suppers in the boathouse she'd turned into a cottage. They were all mad for her, and they'll never forget her. I don't want to know. It's no use, is it? You'll never get the better of her. She's still mistress here, even if she is dead. She's the real Mrs. De Winter, not you. It's you that's the ghost. It's you that's forgotten and not wanted and pushed aside. Well, why don't you leave Mandalay to her? Why don't you go? Yes, why not? We none of us want you. He doesn't want you. He never did. He wants to be left alone in the house with her. It's you that ought to be lying in the church crypt, not her. Now look down there. You can hardly see the sea for fog, can you? It's so easy, isn't it? Why don't you jump? Mm. Wouldn't hurt. Be over in an instant on those rocks. Not like drowning. Why don't you try it? Why don't you go? I won't push you. Don't be afraid of that. You can jump of your own accord. What's the use of staying here at Manderley? Mr. De Winter doesn't love you, you can see that. You haven't any other life to go to either, so there's not much to live for, is there? Why don't you jump now and have done with it? Then you won't be unhappy anymore. Go on. Go on. Don't be afraid. It's the rockets. There must be a ship gone ashore out there in the bay. Frith! Frith! Yes, Mr. De Winter? She's ashore, all right. I was watching her for the headland and I saw her go for the reef. She must have mistaken the bay for Kareth Harbour. They'll never shift her. Not with these tides. Tell them in the house to stand by with food and drink. I'm going back down to the cove to see if I can do anything. And get me some cigarettes, will you? Captain Searle, the harbour master, would like to see you, madam. See me? But surely it's Mr. De Winter he'll be wanting. He did say he wanted to see Mr. De Winter personally, but when I said he wasn't here, Captain Searle asked to see you instead, madam. Well, yes, of course. Send him in. <clears throat> Mrs. De Winter? Come in, Captain Searle. I'm sorry my husband isn't back yet. He must have gone down to the cliffs again. And he was in Kerith before that. <laughs> I haven't seen him all day. Yes, I'd heard he'd been to Kerith, but I missed him there. Uh, he must have walked back across the cliffs while I was in my boat. Oh, do sit down. Uh, I'm afraid uh, the ship has disorganised everybody. Was it to do with that? No, ma'am. It's not the ship that brought me here. Uh, not directly. The fact is, I've got some news for Mr. De Winter, and, uh, well, I hardly know how to break it to him. What sort of news? A couple of hours ago, we sent a diver down to inspect the hole in the ship's bottom. While he was down there, he came across the hull of a little sailing boat, lying on her side, quite intact and not broken up at all. 
He's a local man, and he recognised the boat at once. It was the little boat belonging to the late Mrs. de Winter. I see. Mm. Would anything have to be done about it? Not in the ordinary way, ma'am, no. Mrs. de Winter, the last thing I want to do is cause you or Mr. de Winter any distress. Mm. But the boat itself wasn't all the diver discovered. He broke one of the ports with a stone to have a look inside the cabin. It was full of water, of course. And then he got the fright of his life, Mrs. de Winter. There was a body in there, lying on the cabin floor. It was dissolved, of course, no flesh on it, so it's unrecognisable. When he came up to the surface, he reported it direct to me. And now you understand why I've got to see your husband. She was supposed to be sailing alone. Does this mean there was someone with her all the time and no one ever knew? It looks like it. Who could it have been? Ah, I can't tell any more than you. Anyhow, I'm afraid it'll have to be reported. Oh. Yeah, it's very hard on you, coming now, just when you're settling in. I... If only we didn't have to tell him. You know I wouldn't if it were possible, ma'am, but uh, I've got to do my duty. Hello, what's happening? I didn't know you were here, Captain Searle. Is anything the matter? My old cowardice came over me. I couldn't stand to be in the room and rushed out without looking at Maxim. Later, while on the terrace, I heard Captain Searle's car start up in the drive. His business finished. I returned to the library, knowing what he had told Maxim. If I failed now, I should fail forever. There would never be another chance. Maxim, I don't want you to bear this alone. I want to share it with you. I've grown up in 24 hours. I'll never be a child again. You've forgiven me, haven't you? Forgiven you? What have I got to forgive you for? For last night. Oh, that. I'd forgotten. Can't we start all over again? Can't we begin from today and face things together? I won't ask you to love me. I won't ask the impossible. I'll be your companion. I won't demand anything more than that. How much do you love me? No. No, it's too late, my darling, too late. We've lost our little chance of happiness. No! Yes, it's over now. The thing has happened. What thing? The thing I always foresaw. The thing I've dreamt about. You and I aren't meant for happiness. What are you trying to tell me? Rebecca has won. What? A shadow between us all the time. How could I hold you like this with a fear always in my heart that this would happen? She knew it would happen. She knew she'd win in the end. Maxim, you must tell me. Rebecca's boat. They found it this afternoon. I know. And the body. It means she wasn't alone, doesn't it? That's it, isn't it, Maxim? There was someone with her who didn't drift away from the boat. No, you don't understand. There was no one with Rebecca. She was alone. It's Rebecca's body lying on the cabin floor. No, no! The woman buried in the crypt is not Rebecca. It's the body of some unknown woman. There never was an accident. Rebecca was not drowned at all. I killed her. I shot Rebecca in the boathouse in the cove. I carried her body to the boat and sunk it in the bay. I killed Rebecca! Will you look into my eyes now and tell me that you love me? Little by little, the feeling will come back to me. At the moment, I am nothing. I am just a wooden thing in Maxim's arms. Then he begins to kiss me. He has never kissed me like this before. I put my hands behind his head and shut my eyes. You don't love me. We'll forget that. It won't happen again. Maxim, I love you more than anything in the world. But when you told me just then, I was stunned. I couldn't feel anything then. You don't love me. That's why you couldn't feel anything. Kiss me again, Maxim. No, it's no use now. We can't lose each other. Not now. We've got to be together always with no secrets. Please, darling, please. There's no time. We may have only a few hours left. 
They'll identify her body. There's everything to tell them. The clothes, the shoes, the rings on her fingers. And then they'll remember the woman in the crypt. What are you going to do? I don't know. I don't know. Does anyone know? Anyone at all? No. No one but you and me? No one but you and me. Why didn't you tell me? I couldn't bring myself to. I thought you were unhappy. Bored. You never seemed to want to come to me of your own free will. How could I? When I knew you were thinking about Rebecca. How could I ask you to love me when I knew you loved Rebecca still? Whenever you touched me, I thought you were comparing me to Rebecca. Whenever we did anything together, I thought you were saying this I did with Rebecca and this and this. It was true, wasn't it? Oh, my God! You thought I loved Rebecca? You still think so, even though you know I killed her? I hated her, I tell you. Our marriage was a farce from the beginning. She was vicious, damnable, rotten, through and through. We never loved each other, never had one moment of happiness together. Rebecca was incapable of love, of tenderness, of all decency. When I married her, I was told that I was the luckiest man in the world. She was so lovely, so accomplished, so amusing, and I believed them, or tried to. But there was something, something about her eyes. She made a bargain with me. I'll run your house for you. I'll look after your precious bandole for you, and people will envy us. They'll say we're the luckiest couple in all England. What a leg pull, eh, Max? Yes, she said that. And then she went her own way, knowing that I'd never expose her to the divorce courts. I put Mandalay first before everything else, before even my own shame and loathing and disgust for all that she was and all she did. Oh, my darling, my Maxim, my love. Do you understand? Do you? Our life was a shabby lie. She had her men friends down to stay. She always had men. That fellow Favell, a cousin of hers, took to coming here and staying at the boathouse when I was away. He came here on the day you went to London. You saw him too? Why didn't you tell me? I got it from Crawley, who saw his car turn out of the lodge gates. Anyhow, that night, I warned her that if I found him here, anywhere on the estate, I'd shoot him. He had a filthy reputation. She told me that she could get her faithful Danvers to swear anything she asked her to swear in court. She defied me to try and prove to the world that we were anything less than the perfect couple. If I had a child, Max, she said, neither you nor anyone else would ever prove that it wasn't yours. She laughed and went on laughing. I thought she'd never stop. God, how funny, she said. To all your smug local friends and all your tenants, I'll be the perfect mother like I've been the perfect wife. She turned and faced me, smiling, defiant. When I killed her, she was smiling still. I fired at her heart. She stood there. She didn't fall at once. The bullet passed right through. That slow smile stayed on her face. Her eyes were wide open. I dragged her body into the cabin of the boat and set sail. But a wind came up, and I knew that we'd be in deep water in a matter of minutes if I didn't do something. I opened the seacocks and drove a spike into the planks. The water came in. I got away in the dinghy before the boat sank. I cleaned up the boathouse and was in my room by the time Mrs. Danvers came to me with her fears for Rebecca's life. Later, I went to Edgecombe and identified another woman's washed-up body as hers. I knew it meant nothing. It was only a question of time before the truth came out. She knew she'd win in the end. It was in her smile. Her body had come back. But now I was free of her forever. I was free now to be with Maxim, to touch him and hold him and love him. Yes? Oh, hello, Colonel Julian. I see. What are you going to do? No, I'm afraid I don't. Possibly. Thank you. Good night. Colonel Julian's the magistrate for Kerith. Searles reported to him. He said he has to go out with us tomorrow to examine the boat and the body. He asked me if I had any idea whose body it could be. What did you say? Well, I said I didn't know. And he asked me something else. What? 
He asked me if I thought it possible I had made a mistake when I went up to Edgecombe. He's asked that already. I said it might be possible. Yes, the body will be identified as Rebecca's. You know we're not going to be able to avoid an inquest, don't you? I don't understand, madam, why you sent the change in menu by way of Robert. I should prefer something hot today, Mrs Danvers. If they won't eat the salmon that came in yesterday in the kitchen, then you'd better throw the whole lot away. So much waste goes on in this house that a little more won't make much difference. Don't tell me you can't think of anything to give us. You must have menus for all occasions. I'm not used to having messages sent to me by Robert. Mrs. De Winter always instructed me personally by house telephone. I'm afraid it doesn't concern me very much what Mrs. De Winter used to do. I am Mrs. De Winter now, and if I choose to send a message by Robert, I'll do so. Captain Searle called here yesterday, didn't he? Frith says they found Mrs. De Winter's boat. He says there's a story about a body in the boat. Why should there be a body? Mrs. De Winter always sailed alone. It's no use asking me, Mrs. Danvers. I don't know any more than you do. Don't you? I'll give the orders about lunch. Go on, Mr. Tab. <clears throat> well, sir, after the drowning accident last year, a lot of people in Kerith made unpleasantness about my boat building. Some said I let Mrs. De Winter start the season in a leaky rotten boat. I lost orders on account of it. Well, when her boat was found yesterday, I got permission from Captain Sell to have a look at it. I wanted to satisfy myself that the work I put into it had been sound. Did you come away satisfied? Well, with my own work, yes. But what I want to know is this. Who drove holes in her planking? Rocks didn't do it. The nearest rock was five feet away. Besides that, they weren't holes made by a rock. They were done with a spike. What holes were these? How many of them? Well, there were three of them all together. One right forward by her chain locker, and the other two close together amidships underneath her floorboards at the bottom. The ballast had been shifted too. It was lying loose. And that's not all. The sea cocks had been turned on. What are sea cocks? Well, the fitting that plugs the pipes leading from a wash basin or lavatory, sir. Mrs. De Winter had a little place fitted up right aft. Well, these plugs are always kept tight closed when you're underway. Well, otherwise the water could flow in. When I examined the boat yesterday, both sea cocks were turned full on. Well, with those holes in her planking, sir, and the sea cocks not closed, it wouldn't take long for a small boat like her to sink. Not much more than ten minutes, I should say. Those holes were definitely not there when the boat left my yard. I was proud of my work, and so was Mrs. De Winter. It's my opinion, sir, that the boat never capsized at all. She was deliberately scuttled. <laughs> Mr. De Winter, you heard the statement from James Tabb, who had the care of Mrs. De Winter's boat. Do you know anything of these holes driven in the planking? Nothing whatever. Can you think of any reason why they should be there? No, of course not. It's a shock to you, isn't it? It was shock enough to learn that I made a mistake in identification over 12 months ago. And now I learn that my late wife was not only drowned in the cabin of her boat, but that the holes were bored in the boat with the deliberate intent of letting the water in so that the boat should sink. Does it surprise you that I should be shocked? Uh, Mr. De Winter... I want you to believe that we all feel very deeply for you in this matter. No doubt you have suffered a shock, a very severe shock, in learning that your late wife was drowned inside her own cabin and not in the sea, as you supposed. And I am inquiring into the matter for you. I want, for your sake, to find out exactly how and why she died. I don't conduct this inquiry for my own amusement. That's obvious enough. <laughs> I hope it is. Do you doubt the statement of James Tabb that three holes were hammered through Mrs. De Winter's boat? Of course not. He's a boat builder. He knows what he's talking about. The boat was moored in the private harbour belonging to Mandalay? Yes. Now, James Tabb has told us that a boat with those holes drilled in her bottom and the sea cocks open could not float for more than ten or fifteen minutes. 
Quite. Therefore, we must assume that whoever took the boat out that night drove in the planking and opened the seacocks while the boat was under sail. I suppose so. Does this not strike you, Mr. De Winter, as being very strange? Certainly. You have no suggestion to make? No. None at all. Maxim! Oh. It's all over. What was the verdict? Suicide. Oh. Without sufficient evidence to show the state of mind of the deceased. Had they no idea of a motive? No. Old Horridge wanted to know if Rebecca had any money troubles. No. Money troubles. Well, how did it go? Well, I was fast losing my temper. Then I was asked about my relations with Rebecca. That's when you fainted and had to be taken out. Well, your fainting brought me out with a jerk. I pulled myself together and got through it. I knew exactly what to say, and I said it. I faced Horridge all the time, never took my eyes off him. I'll remember his eyes over those spectacles to my dying day. Something has to happen this evening at the church. They're going to bury Rebecca. It's fixed for 6.30. I wish you didn't have to go out again. We'll talk things over when I get back. We'll start again once this thing is over. We can do it. I know we can. It's ten past six. I must be going. I'll come with you. No. I don't want you to come. Mr. Jack Favell, madam. Good evening, Mrs. De Winter. I trust you are feeling better since that little incident at the inquest. You told my butler you wanted to see Maxim. I'm afraid he's out at the minute. Oh, waiting doesn't bother me. Don't mind putting my feet up after that little farce in Kerith today. Our plans have changed. It's quite possible Maxim won't be back all evening. Oh, has he run off? What do you mean? Well, actually, I rather hope Maxim doesn't get back in time for dinner. What say you? Uh, Mr. Vavell, I'm very tired. If you want to see my husband, you should make an appointment for tomorrow morning. Oh, I'm quite harmless. Really, I am. Max has been telling tales about me, huh? I'm not the big bad wolf, you know. I'm a perfectly harmless bloke. And I think you are behaving splendidly. Been a shock for me, I can tell you. Rebecca was my cousin. I was damn fond of her. Yes, I know. I'm very sorry for you. We were brought up together. All this has been a bloody shock. Sir, what's Max going to do about it? That's what I want to know. Does he think he can sit back now that sham inquest is out of the way? I'm going to see justice is done for Rebecca. Suicide. You and me know it wasn't suicide, don't we? Don't we? What the hell are you doing here? As a matter of fact, Max, old chap, I came over to congratulate you on the inquest this afternoon. Do you mind leaving the house? Or shall I get the servants to throw you out? No, you don't want them to hear what I've got to say, do you? Maxim? <laughs> oh, it's all right. Look here, Max. I guess you don't keep any secrets from your little wifey. So let's put our cards on the table. You know about Rebecca and me. We were lovers, weren't we? I've never denied it. Anyhow, like all the other fools, I believe that Rebecca was drowned in the bay and washed up at Edgecombe. That's how she'd go, I reckon. Then I picked up the paper a few days ago and read about the discovery of the body. I got in touch with Mrs. Danvers and she told me the body was Rebecca's. So I came down to the inquest. Well, Max, old man, what have you got to say about those holes in the planking? The inquest has delivered its verdict. Suicide? Huh. What about this note, then? It was the last note Rebecca ever wrote to me. Here it is. Recognize the handwriting? Dear Jack, I tried to ring you, but could get no answer. I shall be at the boathouse this evening. I'll leave the door open for you. I've got something to tell you, and I want to see you as soon as possible, Rebecca. What do you say to that? Would it have made a difference to the verdict if the coroner had read that? Doesn't sound much like a suicide note, does it? Now then, why can't we come to some agreement on this? Huh? I'm not a rich man. Too fond of gambling for that. What gets me down is that I've never had any capital to fall back on. 
If I had a settlement of two or three thousand a year, I could jog along comfortably enough. Ah, what do you say? You think you can frighten me, don't you? Well, you're wrong. Shall I ring Colonel Julian and ask him to come over? He's the magistrate. He'd be interested in your story. <laughs> Good bluff, but it won't work. You wouldn't dare. I've got enough evidence here to hang you. We'll see, shall we? Maxim. Get me Kerith 1-7. Evening, Colonel Julian. You made very good time. You said it was urgent, so I came at once. I want you to meet Mr. Jack Favell, my late wife's first cousin. Hmm. Your face seems familiar. I probably met you in the old days here at Manderley. Quite. I've asked you here because he has something to tell you. Go ahead, Favell. Look here, Colonel. You were there at that inquest today, and so was I. I'm not satisfied with the verdict. Have your reason? Here's my evidence. A note written by Rebecca to me just before she died. Read that and see what you think. Hmm. Yes. So? Well, is that the note of a woman who wanted to kill herself? Well, on the face of it, no. But we don't know what the note refers to, do we? De Winter, do you know? My cousin made a definite appointment with me in that note. What for, we'll never know, but that's beside the point. She was to spend the night at the boathouse waiting for me. Now, she might suddenly decide to go for a sail, all right, that was like her, but drill holes in the planking and deliberately drown herself like a neurotic girl? Oh, no, by Christ, no. Rebecca never drilled those holes or opened those seacocks. Rebecca was murdered. And if you want to know who the murderer is, there he stands with a superior smile on his face. He could hardly wait out the year before marrying again. Mr. Maximilian de Winter. Ha! He'll look well hanging, won't he? <laughs> drunk. Drunk, am I? I should have known you'd sympathise with the landed gentry. Well, this time for once, I've got the law on my side. If you are such a champion of the law, you might care to explain why you didn't produce this note at the inquest. Because I chose not to, that's why. Oh. I decided to tackle De Winter personally. By telling me he was not a rich man and wouldn't mind a settlement of two or three thousand a year. Oh, I thought it was something like that. But well, I don't know whether you are sufficiently sober to answer my questions, but we'll try. Do you have any proof to back up your accusation of murder? Isn't this no proof enough? Plus the holes in the boat? Can you bring a witness who saw Mr. De Winter do it? A oh, witness be damned. Who else would kill her? Kerith has a large population. Perhaps we should make a door-to-door -door inquiry. Very funny. As a matter of fact, there could be someone. A local halfwit who spends his night sleeping out on the beach in summertime. He'd never have come forward on his own. But I could make him talk if he did see anything that night. Who's he talking about? He must mean Ben, the son of one of our tenants. Can we get hold of this fellow and question him? I'll send Robert down to his mother's cottage straight away. Well, Ben, you know who I am, don't you? Do you know Mr. Favell? i never seen him. Don't be a bloody fool. You've seen me at the boathouse dozens of times, haven't you? No, i never seen no one. Damned half-witted liar. A convincing witness. Has he come to take me to the asylum? I don't want to go there. Them cruel the folk in there. I want to stay home. I ain't done nothing. That's all right, Ben. No one's going to put you in an asylum. Are you quite sure you've never seen this man? I've never seen him. You remember Mrs. De Winter, don't you? No, not this lady, the other lady who used to go to the boathouse. Eh? You were there, weren't you? You saw Mrs. De Winter come down to the boathouse, and then you saw Mr. De Winter too. He went into the boathouse after her. What happened then? What happened? I ain't seen nothing. I want to stay home. I'm not going to the asylum. I never seen you. Never. <laughs> Your witness doesn't seem to have helped you much. <laughs> it's a plot. Somebody's paid him off to deny what he saw. I think Ben might be allowed to go home. Danny will shed some light on this. She'll back me up. Colonel, I demand that you question Mrs. Danvers. Mrs. Danvers was subdued in the presence of authority. She began to cry. 
She cried and cried. No one would stop her. I wanted to scream and run out of the room. Eventually, she recovered herself, and as I expected, she was quite definite that Rebecca wouldn't want to commit suicide. But something else came to light. It was known Rebecca had spent the fatal day in London before returning to Manderley. Mrs. Danvers had her appointment book, and it was decided to look up the date to find out whom she might have seen while in London. Ah,、oh, yes, here we are. Hair appointment at twelve, lunch at the club.、Uh, what's this? Baker, two o'clock. Who was Baker? Baker. I've never heard of anyone called Baker. Well, here it is, Baker, in her own writing. I believe if we knew who he was, we might get to the bottom of this whole thing. She, she wasn't in the hands of money lenders, was she? Mrs. De Winter, it's preposterous. Or blackmailers? Had she any enemies? Anyone she was afraid of? Mrs. De Winter afraid. She was afraid of no one. Who cares about this Baker character? If he was important, why didn't Danny know about him? Rebecca never kept anything from Danny. Well, there's something here at the back of the book, among the telephone numbers. Baker, O four eight eight. No exchange. There's something here too, a mark beside the number. Could it be an M? It might be an M. Hmm. Try museum. Right. Hello. I want you to get me London. Museum O four eight eight. Yes, I'll wait. Oh God, please don't let it be true. Don't let Baker be found. Please, God, make Baker be dead. Don't bring it closer and closer to Maxim. Hello, is that Museum O four eight eight? Can you tell me if anyone by the name of Baker lives there? Yes. Can you tell me who he is? I see. Could I have his address? Yeah, I'll, I'll just take that down. Right. Right. Thank you. It was the night porter from an address in Bloomsbury. It's a doctor's consulting rooms during the day. Now apparently Baker's given up the practice and left six months ago. But the porter gave me his address. It's somewhere near Barnet, north of London. Not on the telephone, so we can't ring him up. No, some goddamn face cream maker. It seems not. The porter told me that Doctor Baker has been a well-known women's specialist. There might have been something seriously wrong with her. I can't understand it. I I don't know what it means. Why didn't she tell me? Why did she keep it from me? She told me everything. I've got something to tell you, and I want to see you as soon as possible. That's what she wrote you for Vell. After she's seen this Doctor Baker,、well, it does connect up. I have to admit, but what the hell was the matter with her?、Oh, there's nothing for it, De Winter. We're going to have to go up to London and see this man. The sooner he's cleared up, the better. I rather think I'd like to come up with you, just to make sure you two don't start cooking up evidence between you. I told Maxim I wanted to go to London to see this through with him. It was decided the four of us would go up by car the following morning, Favell saying he would follow us in his own car. Colonel Julian returned home and Favell to his hotel for the night. That evening, Maxim and I took in the peace and beauty of Manderley. Would it be our last evening? Would another twenty-four hours see Maxim arrested for the murder of Rebecca? Finding Doctor Baker's house in North London seemed an interminable business, but eventually we arrived at tea time that day. Although he had retired from his practice, he'd kept all his medical records at home, but he was reluctant to reveal anything to us until Maxim and Colonel Julian explained the legal implications of the case. The doctor was slow and deliberate. It seemed an age while he went in search of his records. And another age before he got to the nub of the matter. <clears throat> I understand. I wouldn't reveal any of this if the course of justice weren't at stake. Right. Mrs. De Winter had come to me the week before, complaining of symptoms, and I took some X-rays. I haven't the photographs here, but I kept notes on them. 
I remember she said to me, I want to know the truth. I don't want soft words in a bedside manner. Well, she asked for the truth and I let her have it. Go on. The pain was as yet slight, but the growth was deep-rooted. Another three or four months and she'd have been under morphia. An operation by this stage was no earthly use at all. Outwardly, of course, apart from looking a little thin, she seemed a perfectly healthy woman. Oh, and I also found from the X-rays a certain malformation of the uterus. That, of course, had nothing to do with the disease, but it meant she would never have been able to bear a child. I never had the remotest idea. She kept it a secret from everyone. Been a stroke of luck for you, hasn't it, Max? Well, well. The law can get you yet. Have you anything else on your mind? No. I won't keep you. Cut along back to your precious Mandalay. While you still got it. Very you well. He can't do anything to Winter. Just bluffing. He hasn't a thread of a case now. Baker's evidence would quash it. I thought the solution would lie in Baker. A dreadful thing for her. Enough to send a beautiful young woman right off her head. I suppose you never had any idea of this? None. Mm. I don't think it would do any harm if I let it be known quietly around Kerith, that a London doctor has supplied us with a motive for her suicide. People are bound to talk, you know. Oh, by the way, I'm spending the night with my sister in St. John's Wood. Thought I'd get the train back to Cornwall tomorrow. I'm sure you'll be welcome if you both wanted to come back with me to dinner. Well, thank you, but I, I think we'd like to be independent. I don't know what to say about all you've done today. But then you know without my telling you. Oh, my dear fellow, I've been only too glad to be of service. Now you must put it behind you both. You won't have any more trouble from Favelle, I'm sure. But if you do, I count on you to tell me at once. Mm. I'd be inclined, if I were you, to take a short holiday. Go abroad, perhaps. Just faintly possible, certain little difficulties may arise. Uh, not from Favell, but from other quarters. We don't know what's been said, do we? Remember the old saying? Out of sight, out of mind. If people aren't there to be talked about, the talk dies. It's the way of the world. Oh, my sister's down near Avenue Road. I'll let you know where you can throw me out. Nice, quiet dinner, and then we'll take it slowly back to Mandalay. Mm. It won't be too late for you. You know I'd rather be there than anywhere else. How much of the truth do you think Julian guessed? I think he knows everything. If he does, he'll never tell. Never. He won't, perhaps, but there's bound to be endless talk about those holes in the boat. I believe Rebecca lied to me on purpose. She wanted me to kill her, make a quick end of it. That's why she laughed even when I shot her. It was her last joke on me. I'm not sure she hasn't won even now. What do you mean? How can she have won? I don't know. Something's nagging at me. I'm going to ring up Frank Crawley back at the office. I won't be long. Everything all right? Something very odd. Frith telephoned Frank Crawley to say he thought Mrs. Danvers had cleared out. She's gone, disappeared. <laughs> Apparently, she'd been packing all day. Frith rang Frank, and Frank told him to tell Mrs. Danvers to come and see him at the estate office, but she never showed up. About ten past six, she had a long-distance telephone call. At a quarter to seven, Frith knocked on her door, but found her rooms empty. 
They think she must have left the house through the woods. She never passed the lodge gates. Isn't it a good thing? We would have had to send her away anyway. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. I knew there was nothing anyone would do to us anymore. It was going to be very different in the future. We would have people to stay, and I'd see to their rooms, arrange the flowers, order the food, and we would have children. Surely we would have children. The motion of the car was steady, and the pulse of my mind beat with it. A hundred images came to me in my drowsiness. I dreamt of Mandeli and Mrs. Danvers standing at the top of the staircase in her black dress. Then I was sending out invitations in the morning room. But then I looked at them and found they weren't in my handwriting at all. They were written in long, slanting strokes. I pushed the cards away and got up to look in the mirror. A face stared out at me that was not my own. It was very pale, very lovely, framed in a cloud of dark hair. The eyes narrowed and smiled, the lips parted. The face in the glass stared back at me and laughed. <laughs> and then I saw she was sitting on a chair before the dressing table in her bedroom and Maxim was brushing her hair he held her hair in his hands and as he brushed it he wound it slowly into a thick rope it twisted like a snake and he took hold of it with both hands and smiled at Rebecca put it round his neck. No. No. What is it, darling? What's the matter? Sit close. <sighs> oh, you're cold. You've been asleep for two hours. We'll be home soon. What time is it? Well, it's now about twenty past two. It almost looks as though the dawn were breaking over there beyond the hills. Can't be, though. It's too early. Well, it's also in the wrong direction. You're looking west. I know. Maxim. It's in winter you see the northern lights, surely, not in summer. That's not the northern lights. That's Mandalay. Maxim, my God, what's happened? He drove faster, much faster. The road to Mandalay lay ahead. There was no moon. The sky above our heads was inky black. But the sky on the horizon was not dark at all. It was shot with crimson like a splash of blood. And the ashes blew towards us the salt wind from the sea. In Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, Maxim de Winter was played by Christopher Casanova, and Mrs. de Winter by Janet Moore. Mrs. Danvers was Rosalie Crutchley, Jack Favell, Nicholas Grace, and Colonel Julian, Frederick Treves. Mrs. Van Hopper was Irene Sutcliffe, Frith, John Gabriel, Beatrice, Margaret Courtney, Ben, Danny Schiller, and Clarice was Elizabeth Mansfield. Horridge was played by Brian Miller, Tab by John Bull, and Dr. Baker by Geoffrey Whitehead. Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier was dramatized for radio by Brian Miller. The director was Cherry Cookson. <laughs>